Welcome to the Heart Factory. So in this video, we'll talk about the prerequisites of constructing a proximal anastomosis. Now, what is a proximal anastomosis? Proximal anastomosis, I mean, is construction of an anastomosis between the saphenous vein and iota. Now, the definition varies. If it's a lima rima y, the definition is the mouth of the short limb of the y happens to be the proximal anastomosis. So for all practical purposes, we will be describing proximal anastomosis from now on as construction of iota saphenous vein anastomosis. Now there are certain prerequisites the surgeon is supposed to know prior to going ahead with construction of this anastomosis. Now why should someone know some or any details of the ascending iota prior to clamping the iota? Now as we all know, we have to clamp the ascending iota either once or on multiple occasions to construct the anastomosis. Now coronary artery disease is an atherosclerotic affliction. So there is a possibility that patient is having atheroma all along the ascending iota or the arch putting the patient at risk for developing stroke. Now if the patient lands in stroke after CABG, the incidence of which is said to be ranging from 0.3 to 6% depending on the type of literature you read and depending on the definition of stroke. It's a major morbidity which increases the length of stay, it increases the cost of treatment and there is supposed to be a 3 to 6 percent, 3 to 6 fold increase in mortality if the patient lands in stroke for CABG. Now is there a way that we can know which patient is at high risk of developing stroke preoperatively? The answer is yes. Now there are certain investigations which you can definitely do to know the status of the ascending iota which is the most manipulated part during CABG so as not to risk dislodging an atheroma. So what's an atheroma? An atheroma is an intimal thickening which is more than 2 millimeters in size and there are various definitions for it which you will be seeing in the next few minutes of this video. Transesophagelico is the best investigation to know the status of the ascending iota, the status or presence or absence of any intimal thickening or atheroma, whether they are stable, they are, they are mobile, they are large, they are ulcerated, etc. Which part of the ascending iota they are on, whether it's safe to clamp the iota or not. So this information you can get to transesophageal eco, which is available in almost all the theatres. It is safe and the information you get starts right before sternotomy. The only information which you wouldn't be getting with the TE is the status of the arch. There is a blind spot created by the tracheal air for the TE to visualize the arch atheroma. This has also been overcome by a paper where, wherein they have filled the endotracheal tube bulb by saline with saline and it has made them see the arch. So that's beyond the preview of this particular video. The next investigation is apiotic ultrasonography. But the problem here is you must and should have done a sternotomy to do an apiotic ultrasound. It interferes with the conduct of the procedure. Every now and then the surgeon has to hold the probe and uh, then see the plaque and go ahead. There is some problem with assessing the arch uh, in particular view with apiotic ultrasonography. Having said this, it complements TE in knowing the status of the atheroma load, in knowing the status of the ascending iota in telling us whether it is safe or not to clamp it and do a safe anastomosis. There are various papers which have used both these modalities which you will be seeing in the next few minutes. Apart from this we have a CT scan and MRI which will give us the total plaque load but they are not practical in the long run. So this particular information is useful for the surgeon to avoid landing in a complicated stroke situation in the post-operative period. This applies to both construction of the anastomosis on pump and on off pump and these are the prerequisites that we should be knowing prior to going on to our next video. Now and just to recap the anatomy of the thoracic iota ladies and gentlemen, we all know that the ascending iota starts from the sinotubular junction and then at the right innominate artery and the iota between the innominate artery to the left subclavian is the arch and from there downwards to 
the diaphragm metric hiatus is the descending thoracic aorta. Now this is important because we have to know the burden of atheroma, the load, where is the atheroma, what is the status of the atheroma. Now what is atheroma to start with? Atheroma is nothing but thickening of the intima which is more than 2 millimeters in size and various authors have defined it based on the type of the thickening by saying it to be stable or not. So we'll come to it shortly. So the atheroma can be either in the ascending iota, arch or descending iota and some authors have defined the presence of atheroma either anterior in the ascending iota or posterior or the left lateral or the right lateral aspect of the iota and this understanding is very important for us because we will be manipulating the iota extensively during bypass surgery. So which part of the iota will be manipulating extensively? The ascending iota and more of the anterior right lateral and left lateral aspect of the ascending iota will be manipulated. The posterior aspect of the iota is rarely manipulated except whilst placing the aortic cross clamp. Now if you come to the, uh, to the description of the position or placement of the atheroma and type of atheroma by various authors, the first paper one has to know is uh, from uh, Colin Royce et al from the Royal Melbourne Hospital, Melbourne, Australia and based on the area of manipulation that the surgeon does during surgery, they have classified or divided the aorta, the thoracic aorta into six zones. Zone 1, 2, 3 is the ascending aorta, zone 4 and 5 is the arch and zone 6 is the descending aorta. Now you can imagine my after doing a sternotomy be it on pump CABG or off pump CABG, you will be handling the ascending iota more. There is rarely handling of any arch. There is no question of handling the descending iota at all. So these are the descriptions done on uh, epiotic ultrasound and transesophageal echo. They also describe the position of the plaque, whether it is anterior or posterior to the iota or it's on the left lateral aspect of the aortic segment or right lateral aspect of the aortic segment to almost all the zones. Not only that, this particular paper also talks about the thickness of the intima. That is, I may I, I told you atrium is nothing but intimal thickness that's more than 2 millimeters. It can be 2, 2 to 4 or more than 4 millimeters and once it starts reaching 4 to 5 millimeters, one has to see whether it is flat, it's calcified, it's mobile, or it's ulcerated or is there a thrombus on that and uh, based on this description you can see they have also classified the severity as to nil, mild, moderate and severe of the atheroma and with this you can extrapolate the risk of stroke the patient would likely end up with after manipulating the iota. Now what are the chances of manipulating the iota by the cardiac surgeon? So when you see zone 1 is rarely manipulated except while doing an aortic valve replacement. Even during off pump CABG or on pump CABG, zone 1 we rarely go and tend, attend or disturb that area. The possibility is that the area between the zone 1 and zone 2 will be the fat pad which you see on the ascending iota every time probably is the area where we do an iototomy for aortic valve replacement. Apart from that, zone 2 and 3 are the ones we usually be manipulating more often than not. Zone 2 will be for placing the proximal anastomosis or by placing the anterior cardioplegia cannula. Then zone 3 will be for placing the aortic cannula to initiate cardiopulmonary bypass or in some situations also to place proximal aortosuffinous venous grafts. So the more area of manipulation by the cardiac surgeon is ascending iota zone 1 to 3. Zone 4 and 5 is rarely handled by the surgeon directly and zone 6 is out of question. And also when you see the presence of atheroma, anterior left lateral and right lateral atheroma will be handled or manipulated by the surgeon whereas rarely the posterior atheroma is touched except for placing the aortic cross clamp. Now as I said before, the first three zones are handled by the surgeon but what about the plaques which are there in the arch? More often than not, the arch is the area where you find large plaque burden and uh, you would not have handled the arch but yet the patient would be landing up in stroke in which case the reason pointed out is the aortic cannula. So once you start perfusing the aortic cannula, 
the thrombi in the arch dislodges and causes stroke so there is no physical manipulation by the surgeon but it is flow related whereas those plaques in zone 6 are disturbed by either by an iabp or by a pci so that is something coming from the femoral artery upwards In this picture you will see our side biting clamp either the large one or the smaller one is usually placed in zone 2 or 3 so and any plaque in the posture is still safe for you to do a proximal anastomosis so in this paper they saw that when you do an anaotic surgery that is when where surgeons are doing lima rima y and not touching the aorta at all the risk of manipulation is hardly to hardly 5 out of 68 patients Whereas the risk of manipulation is almost 21 out of 68 patients uh, when you do a, a side biting and place the proximals on the iota. So what basically this means is the more you manipulate the iota, the more the risk of stroke. So there should be a way for us to know which patients are at risk for stroke and which patients are safe. Another classical paper is from CATS et al, wherein they have classified the thickness of the intima and have graded the patient in five groups. The fifth group is a patient having more than 5 mm of intimal thickness and having a mobile thrombus. If you have such a patient, especially in the ascending iota, the risk of thrombus is almost 47% and is an absolute contraindication for placing the side biting clamp. Same scenario exists in patients who are in grade 4 who are having more than 5 mm of uh, intimal thickness but here the crux is if that particular thickness is in the arch or in the descending thoracic iota or in ascending iota but placed posteriorly you can still place the side biting clamp and go ahead and do an proximal anastomosis but the risk of stroke is around 10.5%. The other three grades, there is hardly any risk of stroke secondary to cross clamping. And with this information, we'll go ahead to our next video, which will be dealing in real time the construction of proximal anastomosis. I hope you like this video. If so, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel. I would appreciate if you leave some comments which is which are constructive for all of us to learn. Please do not forget to click the ring button as well just to be notified of my video in time. Thanks for your support. Thank you.